Hello everybody, welcome back to another Friday night live stream. Tonight we are going to be working on forging the cheek pieces of our wrought iron sledgehammer. Uh, we are going to be getting them prepped for welding on in the next week's live stream. Um, so be sure to check out next Friday if you're following along on, these prop, on this whole project and process. Uh, but I've got some other pieces uh, forged up today. I've got the high carbon steel faces forged up. We will do those and hopefully the, the next sequential, sequential or what are you? Sequential. Mm -hmm. Sequential. Is that what we always say? Yep. The next sequential live stream after that one. Uh, we'll get the faces welded on. Uh, we have to make up the cheek pieces first because we do not want to take a chance of burning up the high carbon tool steel bits in the process of welding, right? We don't want to take and weld on these cheek pieces doing the decorative work or the non-essential parts of this hammer. And, in the, and while doing that, we burn up the faces. So, that's what we'll be working on this evening. I've got a piece of one inch or 25 mil, roughly thereabouts, wrought iron, uh, round in dimension and cross section there. And I've got it on a fairly long bar here. And I'm gonna forge out what I need, make sure it's getting to the right shape that I'm needing for my two cheek pieces. And then it'll get parted off from the bar to stop from there. So. Um, so we're going to try to get these prepped tonight. This stream, we're only going to go for about an hour to two hours maximum. So if you're watching this on the replay, this first part of this is going to be a lot of really boring minutia alert. So uh, you may want to skip ahead if, that's, uh, if you're watching this on the replay. But other than that, I'm glad you're here with us. I'm glad you joined us for Friday night. So without, that, without further ado on that one, Jessica, how many people we got in the stream? Sure. Let me start saying hi to people. Yeah, uh, it says we have 17 watching, if that's updated. Awesome. Graham was the first one in here and says hello. Graham, hello. Good to have you, sir. Thank you for being here. Jorge La. Hola. Hola. <laughs> Billy Martin says hello. Billy Martin, hello. Pleasure as always. Yakov Hayes. Yakov Hayes, good to have you here. Ben Toom says, woohoo, I made it. You did, Ben. About time you'd be on time for something. <laughs> woohoo! What the Forge says, hi, Roy and Jess, good to see you again. Hello, hello, good to see you as well. Well, hear you. We also have Jason Sullivan, BNB Forge. Hello, hello, hello. Good. John Lavender says, evening all. Signed up for your newsletter and got the first installment yesterday. Good content. Thanks. <laughs> awesome. Well, thank you for signing up for the newsletter, John Lavender. I'm glad you enjoyed it. Yeah, it's been, uh, I hadn't done one since March, so it was a little overdue. But yeah, yep. <laughs> I finally sat down. I'm like, it's time to get it written. And then I reviewed it with Roy and got it, got it sent out. Yeah, it takes a lot to put together those sometimes, so. Mm -hmm. And uh, to make sure we're not feeding you boring content. Yeah, yep. Try to from make sure behind you, the scenes. Try to make sure you get some interesting little tidbits there. Yep. Drayson69 right. says, Even and Roy and Jess working on supper, but listening and peeking in now and then. All right, awesome, Drayson69. Thank you for watching and helping us on the watch time minutes. We appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and talk for the first little bit of the live. We've got this piece up nice and hot. I'll get to that here in a second. I just want to take a few minutes, uh, and I say few minutes lightly, uh, over here at my little sketch, my little doodle pad here. And I want to take and talk a little bit about hammer design. So I'm not going there just yet, Des. I'll let you know what okay. I do. Uh, I want to talk a little bit about hammer design and working with rod iron. So as you can see, I'm taking you through an interesting process and you could be counting yourself why go through all this mess right to take and make a hammer when you could just make it out of something a high carbon piece of steel and just one shot done right well i'm going through a traditional process of making a hammer now obviously if the smiths of old would have a large chunk of wrought iron to start with they would have just used the large chunk of wrought iron because it would have saved them time to make a sledgehammer they would have welded the faces on and been done with it 
Also, chances are it wouldn't be as decorative as what I'm going to be doing with this hammer. So again, there's extra elements here that aren't going to be a traditional type deal, but they are all the methods used is going to have that traditional element to them. So we start off with our, <coughs> our stacking up weld here, our faggot weld. We got that all together and compressed and put together. And I'm going to show you what that looks like right here. I further refined it. Jessica, let's go to the anvil here. I'll show you. All right. So I further refined this billet on that Saturday. Uh, and then I did a little extra refining to it today to get that to be like a solid chunk, a square block, all welded up nicely. As you can see, mm -hmm. all nice and square like. And then I also prepped the high carbon steel faces. And if you followed the little wrought iron hammer video when I did that, you, you've seen how I cut these barbs up in order to stick into the wrought iron when we break. So this way we could put the pieces in and we don't have to use electric welding or arc welding. This is another, again, this is a traditional way of doing it. Now on a billet this big and faces this big, technically that's not needed. If you had some extra help, you could just take, have one in a one pair of tongs, one in another pair, bring them out to the anvil. There's enough welding heat here that you just lay them on top of one another and just weld it right in. There's no problem with that at all. You don't need the barbs. I am going to attempt the barb method since I'm by myself uh, with the forging end of it. And we'll get that good and hot and then weld that up. But again, that'll be in hopefully next week's live stream. But I got those all prepared. So now I've got a mass, a billet big enough. This started off as one inch thick by two inches wide. And then we folded it all up to where it was a stack of four inches tall by two inches wide. And then we forge welded that down. And now it's sitting at just right around two and three quarter inches tall or so. Yeah, well actually two and a half. I squished it down more, excuse me. So this is sitting at two and a half inches tall now. Um, and it's still two inches wide and then this is roughly four inches long. So pretty good size billet. It's definitely heavy. <laughs> it's still got a lot of mass to it, but you can see that it's really compressed those fibers even more. So this method that I'm doing is a very traditional way of building up a hammer. And so tonight, the cheek pieces we're working on that are gonna go on here, between here and here on this hammer, it's going to be done the same way. They're going to get forged out. They're going to be prepped with some sort of some sort of scarf, if you excuse me, and then they will get forge welded right onto the sides. And we'll do that to the other side as well. So it'll have cheeks on both sides of the hammer. And we have to do that first because if we do not do that first, and we get these hammer faces on there, like I said earlier in the stream, you could take a chance while welding these up, burning the ends, or unnecessarily so burning your uh, high carbon steel faces, and we don't want that. So we, I think we can leave it here, honey. Mm -hmm. I'll take and show my noodle pad it here in a little bit. All right. I think this is good and hot. Let me, uh, let me check on it. Nope, you need to go up a little hotter with it. So you can go to the main cam. Okay, back to the main cam. Yep. Gotcha. Okay. So if there's any questions on that, go ahead and drop them in the comment section. Do attention roll or something, or hashtag roll or something, and I'll try to answer those questions if you can. Pastor Josh Smith says, looks like the Dread Pirate Roy is back with us tonight. Yep, he is. So, I missed this shirt. So <laughs> it was in the wash, and then I also, I didn't wear it because I was wearing my big apron the other evening, and they didn't feel good together, so got it back on. Yep. What the Forge says, I love this shirt. It's my favorite. <laughs> yeah, we actually found it on Amazon. Uh, we ended up adding it to our Amazon yep. influencer page, so. Now, it's not 100% linen. I checked out the linen shirts, um, 
I have not bought those yet. They are actually cheaper than what this shirt is. So it is a cotton shirt, though. This is 100% cotton, but it's not 100% linen. Linen shirt. So I'll have to check out and try out the linen shirts. Drayson69 says, Roy, would you consider a trade for a chunk like you sent Big Dog Forge and Black Bear Forge? I have some copper bar. Yeah, I could consider that. What size copper bar? Let's see what the forge says. I'm waiting on my order of cunning just to arrive so I can finish fabricating my first coal forge. I can't wait. Haha, -ha, cool. You Jake. will enjoy them, I think. Jason Sullivan of Shamrock Forge says, I'll be having another go at Cable Damascus tonight. Got her all cleaned up and ready to go after this stream. Awesome. Well, good luck with your Cable Damascus. I've heard that that's a fun one to make. So many things in blacksmithing as this is coming up to heat here. I'll just share a little philosophy here. Um, so many things in blacksmithing has everything to do not with the project, but with the process. So it's the route you chose to take and get to your end result. Depends, it takes and dictates how hard or how easy that job was for you. Some stuff is just difficult. It's difficult to work with. If you ever work with silica bronze, silica bronze is a pain in the butt. It's got a very short temperature band where you can work it, but it's a process. And at the end of it, it looks gorgeous, right? Everybody loves the look of bronze. Bronze is a great looking color on material. Uh, rod iron, same thing. If you haven't worked with rod iron, there's a whole set of processes that you have to go through in kind of a way of thinking to work with wrought iron. You can't just, you know, sit there and punch and drift and just slam the drift through it, right? Like you would in mild steel or a structural grade steel. So it takes a little more forethought and a little more pre-planning uh, before you just go ahead and punch and drift a hole in wrought iron. So, but that is part of the fun. That is the challenging part. That is the fun part of forging for me is the process, not necessarily the end result. Because when the end result's done, you just go back to the forge. And you go back to working again. So I like challenging processes. Uh, and stuff like cable Damascus or working with Damascus and doing different pattern welding and stuff like that uh, could be, it can be a lot of fun. Uh, but it can be broke down to its simplest elements, which is its processes going forward. Let me grab a glove here with my left hand and bring this out to the ample. So you can keep reading comments. Sure. Let's see. Uh, Edge Gray Wolf just dropped in. Edge Gray Wolf, thanks for being here. All right, you ready? Yeah, sure. Yeah. Go ahead. You can keep reading them off. Oh, okay. Uh, Billy Martin, I need to find some steel plate so I can redo the outside of my forge, but until I get that put together, this one will work. With the forge says there's 44 watchers and 22 likes and reminds everybody to hit the like button. Yep. Hit those like buttons, people. Corey Shire. Hashtag Roy. I'm sure I can figure out where the term fairy flip came from, but is there any particular reason why it's called a faggot weld? Um, all I know of the history of the term faggot or faggoting is to stack, is what its definition is. It's to stack. It's an old English term, um, and it's just a historical term. As far as the reason to call it that, you don't have to call it that. I'm just speaking specifically from a historical reference point. Um, so you don't have to, you don't have to call it that if you don't want to, honestly. Uh, and then, you know, again, it's just what it was called back in the day. And it means to stack, basically to stack a piece. And when it's been referenced. Um, to faggot weld is to 
basically do like you see me done here. Basically where there's pieces in alternating layer direction like this, that is where it's most referenced to blacksmiths in that portion of it. Uh, there's a little, there's a little bit of information in history, not a lot, that I have been able to resource on that same term in industry. So they used to bring out, like I said, they used to load wrought iron bars and stuff whenever they were making anchors or needed a big billet of wrought iron. They would just lay and stack like cordwood all the wrought iron they could find, little bits and pieces and horseshoes and tire rims and you name it, stuff like that, right? Would just load these up, wagon wheels. They'd just load it up in a big pile and shove it into a giant, a gigantic forge, pull it out, and then weld that whole piece together. And somewhere in there, uh, they, they used the term faggot for a while, but then they switched over to using the word billet instead. So that's kind of another thing. That comes a lot in the way of, we all understand billet like in Damascus, right? Or pattern welded billets of Damascus, right? Pattern, this is a pattern welded billet of whatever, you know, add whatever you want on the end of that dot, dot, dot. But it's a kind of a, it's a historical reference for basically stacking, a stack weld. Corey, Shad, Corey Shire says, Roy, I've heard the, that the old English team bundle of sticks. What's that say? Yeah, he's saying he's heard that before, but that term used for a bundle of sticks. For a bundle of sticks. Mm -hmm. So there you go. Yep. Again, it, it, again, it's just to, uh, you know, to stack, make one. Old English. <laughs> and the only reason why I'm using it here is because if you if you look at some older textbooks, they use the term of faggot welding something together. And if that term gets lost, you wouldn't understand what that meant. So this is what they mean by that whenever you read an old textbook or something like that that has that terminology in it. Um, this, is what, this is what they're reading. Backwoods Raised asks, have you, have you always used a coal forge or have you used a gas forge also? Uh, Backwoods Raised, I have both in the shop. I use predominantly coal, but my work dictates oftentimes what the tool is that I use. So I do have a main coal gas forge. I use it pretty regularly. Uh, I use the coal forge pretty regularly. Again, it just depends on the job that comes through the door. Uh, speaking of jobs, I have a ton of work coming up. Um, so that's one of those things where uh, the videos and things end up, if it seems like I'm stretching this out, it's because I have a lot of work in between. Uh, basically, my next eight months is sold out uh, with work. That's 40 hours a week for the next eight months is pretty much sold. So that means I will have to fit in these live streams as I can uh, with this type of stuff. But what I wanted to mention about that is so the work that I do is varied. It's really a variety. I have everything from custom hammers that I'm making uh, to fire, fireplace grates and screens to fireplace frames to fire pokers to, uh, gosh, I've lost my brain. There's a hearth bunch. Plate. I, I've got a copper hearth plate, another one of those to do. Um, I've got copper work to do a bunch of copper vessels and bowls to make. Uh, and uh, I'm probably missing a few, but I got a bunch of other things too that I've got to do. So my work varies. And so that's where I don't, this is where I say, you know, don't let your tool dictate what you do, so to speak. You know, uh, there's not one better than the other. Coal's not better than gas. Gas is not better than coal. It just, the, the work dictates 
what item you use or what tool you use to get the job done the most efficiently. At least in my shop it does. Some people are purists. Some people, they're all, if you're not doing it in coal, you're not blacksmithing. And then there's other people that, you know, they go the other way. You know, if, if you're not forging in a gas forge, you don't know what you're missing. You're, you're wasting time, you know, or whatever. And I'm not a purist. I am an efficient person. And I make my living at this, so whatever tool gets the job done the quickest, that's the one that gets used the most. Let's see here. I'm going to pull this out and keep hammering on it. Sure. So basically, you go to the anvil. Okay. So basically, all I'm doing is I'm trying to create a nice flat rectangle, about 3 8 inch thick, um, and then just long enough that I can cut two pieces out of it. Good. All right. I was prepared this time for the spark. Pastor Josh Smith saw me uh, duck before I started hammering. <laughs> Let's see. Um, let me take a moment and acknowledge the two super chats that we received. Awesome. We received a 10, I think that's euros. It's either euros or pounds. Um, 10 euros from Liam Buck. Hey, thank you, Liam Buck. Appreciate that. And also five dollars from Dan Maggiore. Thank you, Dan Maggiore. And she had left a comment too. Um, hi Danielle guys. Uh, or Dana. 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 Mm -hmm. Dana. Yep. All right. I thought you said Dan there. No, Dana. So, hi guys from Off the Grid Blacksmith. Love all your videos. Awesome, Off the Grid Blacksmith. Thank you so much. For the five dollars super chat, was it? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, thank you. Let's see, uh, Drayson69, just thought the copper bar would be cool on your copper bowls for handles. Uh, you'll have to say what size that was again. I missed the comment. Uh, I think you said it was quarter inch plate um, by something. You'll have to say that again. What the Forge? I can't remember which video it's in, but he has over 700 videos, so that's understandable. Uh, yeah, it's over 800 now. <laughs> yeah, there's over... Right now, as of the recording of this, there's 800 and I believe it is, <laughs> I don't know, it's a bunch. It's, it's, it's over 30, isn't it? I think so. I think so. I don't know. It might be 827 or it might be 837. I've lost track. I've lost track. So, there's a bunch. Mm -hmm. Somebody can look it up and let us know on the live stream. Yeah. <laughs> oh, thank you all for the super chat, and I didn't get around to saying it because I was hammering. Did everybody give them a hand clap in the comment section? Those who are supporting this stream, thank you. Thank you, thank you, once again. Backwoods Race says, okay, thank you. I guess I missed the gas forge video. Every video I have watched was you on the coal forge. Um, if you go way back to, I think, um, making a skillet series, we did three videos. I think those were in the gas forge, if I'm not mistaken. I think so, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, one reason why you won't see me use the gas forge a lot while I'm vlogging, uh, and you see a lot of coal forge in the videos, is because the coal forge is incredibly quiet in comparison to my gas forge. My gas forge has a forced air burner, and it's pretty loud. You know, it gets really loud in here. And so if I was trying to demonstrate or instruct on a piece, and I did it in the gas forge, it'd just be too loud. So I do have some videos, but when I was using the gas forge, I usually did some sort of time lapse and a voiceover in those videos. Uh, Drayson69 said uh, it's quarter inch by half inch. Let me know how long. They are about 10 foot long but can be rolled up for mailing. I believe he said he salvaged the copper from something. Okay, quarter by half. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I'd be interested in that. Just uh, gmail me on it. And we'll work out the details from there. 
Kevin McIntyre says, why did you look at your wife when you said you were efficient? Smiley face. <laughs> Some days I'm not efficient. <laughs> I try to be, darn it. Coffee Sports says, found me a hand crank blower like yours for $75. Just have to drive to Maryland to get it. Woohoo! That's a bit of a trip. Well, if it's in good shape, it's worth it. Depending on what vehicle you have, you might spend over $75 in gas to get there. Uh, Ed Gray Wolf says, where can a person get wrought iron? Um, so the easiest place to, you know, it's very hard to find wrought iron. Uh, the best way that you can find wrought iron is if there are like gates or railings being tore out. Uh, sometimes you can find it at local blacksmith meets, although it is rare. Um, I have gotten my wrought iron at Quad State um, by one by one guy by the name of Keith Summers. Uh, I got hit, I got wrought iron from him several years back, and it's just kind of piled up here. Uh, so you know you just kind of have to look and ask around. If you're down at your local scrapyard, occasionally they will have something. If you can buy from your local scrapyard, they'll have something like that show up. You know, so it is possible to find it in a dumpster and things like that. Uh, you can look around online, although prices are very high online, so you may want to watch it there. I need to watch my piece because it's starting to get hmm. overly hot. Can't get it. Can't have it get sparky on you. Nope. All right, ready? Yep. It's going to be a squirter. All right, I'm ducking. Woo. Yep, that was a good one. <laughs> David Bitten, welcome for your first live stream with us. flip in this camera screen to protect it. Okay. Alright, so now at this color temperature is where you're going to want to stop hitting on it. Now you may say, okay, well you were burning it. And to a degree I was, but wrought iron you can take up about that hot come out as a white ball of lightning there and you not damage anything. Again, wrought iron has almost zero carbon content in it. Now when I brush this off, you'll see hardly any problem with it at all. Mm -hmm. So I mean, it was white bulging hot there, mm -hmm. but it's in perfectly good shape not burn or anything. Oh, you guys will have to, do you notice anything different from this camera angle from our last live stream? We're going to see if they're astute. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. See if they catch on. I think we got a pretty astute audience. I think so. Yeah, so there we go. So we got that pretty well. Um, it's still not as wide as it needs to be. So I'm going to get some more width on it. It's about the thickness that I want it to be, but again, it's not as wide as I need it to be. So I'm going to bump this up. Once I get it cut from the bar, I'm going to bump this whole thing up. So that means I need to put some extra length in it so I can get that width. And basically, I'm converting round bar to plate. Mm -hmm. Becky Smith says, I recently got bit by the blacksmithing bug, and your mini hammer keychain is on my list to do soon. Awesome. Got little mini hammers, a fun little project. Andrew Freeman says, asking for prayers and well wishes, as I will be changing jobs soon to one that will give me my evenings and weekends back, which of course means more forging with my Father's Day leather apron. Pretty awesome. cool. Glad to hear you got an apron, too. You said that was Andrew Freeman? Yep. All right. Best wishes and prayers for you, buddy. 
Everything works out good with that. Got note 1061 says, why don't you use your power hammer to do this? Isn't it going to be more efficient than hand hammering this billet? Uh, yes and no. So yes, it could be more efficient. Uh, but my ideal, my concept with this hammer and with a lot of what I'm trying to teach and show in the channel and uh, is to basically, hopefully you guys can understand this, is to basically show guys that you don't need a lot of fancy dancy technological equipment, you don't need a whole bunch of power hammers and presses to be able to do a job like this. Um, you know, had I not had the help out of Dan Roswood uh, and uh, Chirpy the other evening to help me forge weld up that billet, I could have just as well welded it up myself. Would it have been as easy? No but I could have done it with a regular hand hammer and I would not have had to, you know, I wouldn't have had to break out some big heavy sledge or anything. Obviously you get more material done in a two hour time frame, but say you're doing this by yourself, most likely, you're, most likely you're not doing a two hour time block. You might be forging for four hours, maybe six hours. So what does it matter? You can take that extra time to get that same amount of material moved. So I'm trying to show people the way that you could do it without the tools and the technology. So a lot of my projects that I undertake here on this channel are the same way. You know, I do have the occasion thing where I show a build where I use a welder. But you can buy a cheap, cheap welder at Harbor Freight these days and you can find a Lincoln Buds box. I went to the store the other day, uh, to Lowe's I think it was, and like a little Lincoln weld or a little Lincoln buzz box that would be more than it capable of welding up any of the tools you've ever seen me build in this shop was only 300 bucks. I mean 300 bucks and you've got the thing for the next 25 years, right? Mm -hmm. um, that's a small investment into your shop. But I try to keep those type projects and things to a minimum and keep the stuff to things that you can do with hand, hammer, and anvil, right? Or some of the basic shop things. When I was first getting into this, it always seemed like the projects or the guys that I looked up to at that time always had power equipment. So I always felt like, well, that's nice, but now I can't do it because I don't have a power hammer. Or, well, now I can't do it because I don't have that press. Or, well, I can't do it because I don't have a TIG welder, right? or oh, I can't do it because I don't have a plasma cutter and things like that. And so this is kind of some of the premise of my channel is to help people who don't have all those things and show that yes, it can be done right here in hand crank forge and, and just an anvil in a vice, right? And so that's kind of the, the premise of why. Um, I've answered that a few times on the stream and I'm sure I'll answer it a whole bunch more Right. And it's a great question uh, because what do I do normally? I am not a purist normally. I'm not. I have to make my living at this. And so for me, it's whatever is most time efficient. So a power hammer, say I had to make this for a client, huh, I'm going straight up power hammer and press. I'm not going to mess around. I, you know. Uh, all this stuff where I'm doing the traditional way of attaching the faces, I'd probably just put a couple little plug welds on it, roll weld BBs on them and grind them out in the finished product and just, you know, move right along. Get the thing up to heat, weld it up, and so on and so forth. Um, so, and chances are I probably wouldn't even have chose wrought iron to do this. I would use mild steel and then weld the high carbon steel faces to it if they wanted that kind of thing going on. Um, also, you know, like, again, I'm not afraid to break out the torch or break out a welder or break out a plasma cutter or flip on the press or flip on the power hammer and go right straight to them when it comes down to me making the living at it. But this here, when I'm teaching, it's not so good to teach people that, hey, without a power hammer, you're out of luck. Can't get this done. Um, basically, that's it. So just like when I billeted this up, right, I started, you know, it's hard to find a large chunk of wrought iron this big. 
very, very, very hard to find a large chunk of wrought iron this big. Maybe, maybe you might get lucky and find a bridge that's being tore down, like this material is being made from. Uh, maybe you might get lucky and be on the coast and find a large anchor, an old wrought iron anchor you can cut apart and get some big mass billets of wrought iron out of. That would almost be sad, uh, though, to cut up something like that. Yeah, and that, that's <laughs> almost sacrilegious right there, right? It's kind of tear that down. Um, but just doing that whole process of doing the faggot weld shows you that you can take small bits of material and weld them up yourself to get up enough mass to do this. Uh, so it is obtainable by everyone, mostly. If you have a hammer, you have an anvil of some kind, and you've got some sort of fire that you can get the material to a proper forging temp, you can do this, just like I'm doing. And I am the king of long-winded answers, so you probably got the point 20 minutes ago. Paul's Garage says, I heard it said, don't take the long road to finish a project. When you're done, there will be three more projects to do anyway. Yup. Uh, let's see here. Graham, thank you for the $2 super chat. He said, this is the best I can do this time around. Graham, thank you, buddy. You've done enough. We appreciate you so much. Thank you for the $2 super chat and everybody give him a hand clap. Donald Roberts says, I got an order to make S-hooks using threaded rod. Also, he wants me to make a dual picture frame out of it. Awesome. Cool. What the forge, oh, his guess was, remember I asked what was different? His guess is there's a red tool cart this time. I don't remember it being there. <laughs> it probably just had to zoom out a little bit more. Right. No, that's not quite it. Let's see, uh, Kevin McIntyre says, hand hammering kills my shoulders, can only do it for about half an hour at a time. Okay. What, uh, just curious, what size hammer are you using? And what style of hammering are you doing? Because there is certain circumstances where it's your hammering, it's your grip, or it's the hammer that you're using that can cause you shoulder issues. Um, then again, it might be from a previous injury or something like that, and I can totally understand that. In which case, you want to invest into something that does the hammering for you and still use a really light, loose grip on the material so you don't get that jar or that kinetic energy into your shoulders. What the Forge says, the best piece of advice I ever got about hammering was keep your elbow in. Uh, yep, that could be a good one. The closer that is the body, the more control you have. North Country Forge says, huge news and opportunity for me. I get to demo at the New York State Woodsman Field Day in my hometown. Three days and upwards of 60,000 people come to this event every year. Awesome, congratulations. Like, sounds like an good awesome job. opportunity. All right, let's go to the anvil, honey. All right. So I'm going to bump this up now. Basically, I'm just going to hammer it on the anvil, and then I'm just going to continue to spread out the material. You can send us a message on Facebook. Sometimes it takes us about a week to get back, though. All right. I'm almost getting there. there in width. 
Check it. Check it. Very, very close to what I'm wanting. Mm -hmm. One more forging and spreading heat and it'll be there. Be exactly where I'm wanting it. Mm -hmm. Very nice. Go again. All right. So we are up to 67 people watching, about 40 minutes in. Good, good, good. Uh, so if you know anybody who'd be interested in this live stream, take a moment and share the link. Uh, we're probably roughly about halfway through our live stream tonight. Um, also, take a moment. We ordered in some new shirts lately. I'm going to show you the ice cream shirt. This is Roy's favorite. Um, let's see if you can see it. It says, we can't all be the flavor of the day. I know Graham has this one. Uh, I don't know if anybody else has ordered it yet. But yes, that's one of Roy's sayings uh, from a couple of months ago. We said we were going to turn it into a t-shirt and finally did. So that's what it looks like. Yeah. I like that one a lot. Because I am definitely not everybody's flavor of the day. Only downside is we don't like have ice cream out here in the shop right now. Yeah. I'd like to be perfect. <laughs> Let's see, Mike G, we are working on the wrought iron hammer. I'm glad you could join us. Yep, thanks for being here, Mike G. Um, okay, so what the forge says, you didn't get a new anvil, did you? And nope. Manga12 says, did you get your hair cut, Roy? Seems shorter and blonder. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have had a haircut, yes. I think we're going to have to let them in. Let them in on what's different. <laughs> I'm what not sure I know what's different. Oh, you don't? Uh-uh. We spent two days working on it. Whisper, whisper. <laughs> Should we leave them hanging? Maybe. Well, I don't know if they can see there. Can they? Yeah, they can. Can they from, see that part of the forge? Yeah, from the anvil cam, they can see down below the forge and stuff. You're giving too much oh, eye. I'm sorry. Well, they don't know. They don't. Ah, ah. So basically, I spent the last two days cleaning the shop, so it needed it. I removed two wheelbarrows full of ashes from underneath the forge and around the slat tub. So I've got a lot more space. Mm -hmm. Yeah, or what feels like more space. I remember somebody had said that they wanted to come and clean your shop for you. So however it was with the OCD, there you go. It's yeah, better now. It's, it's better now. You can come back. Yeah. Good stuff. No, false garage says ice cream and a hot forge. I think you mean milkshake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that would probably be better. Have it contained in a cup. You might be right on that. Milkshake. Okay. 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 Pastor Josh Smith, someone last week said the ice cream was on them. <laughs> what the forge? Uh, yeah, we did see Black Bear Forge's video uh, about his decision on what to make with the billet. Yeah, um, that's going to be awesome. Yeah, yeah, that's going to be really cool. Yeah, so uh, John Switzer, Black Bear Forge. So they didn't mention it at the beginning of this video, but uh, I'm going to get better about that in the next video. So I have chose to select to make this hammer my part of this multi-channel collaboration that I am doing between myself, John Switzer at Black, Bear, at Black Bear Forge, Tim over at Big Dog Forge, and David at Work With Nature, right? Yep. Um, I sent everybody a billet of wrought iron and then uh, they are going to make something from it, a project of some kind, um, anything, basically anything that they could set their mind to. And John just released a video today that he is going to do a dragon door knocker. So it's going to be really, really awesome. And uh, I think that's going to look really, really cool. My head is already swimming with the ideals of figuring out exactly how he's going to do that. And uh, I think I know how, but I'm going to leave that a mystery for everyone else. So that way everybody can watch the video. <laughs> but yeah, so really cool stuff coming out. Excuse me a second, got to get a right, sure. thing here. Uh, 
Thomas Downing Watchtower. It's called a coal swab. Roy has a video on how it's made and kind of explains the use on it if you want to go into real great detail on that. Yeah. And the other question about the green tape on the tools, it's so Roy can locate his tools when he is demonstrating or teaching a class. Yep, yep. Yep. All correct. All right. Let's go over the anvil test. All right. So I'm going to bump this up just a wee bit more. You good? Uh-huh. Yeah, okay. So I'm going to bump this up just a wee bit more, get it spread out a little bit better, and then I'm going to use this hot cut, and I'm going to cut it across about the length I need it to be cut off. Um, and then uh, we will move on to the second cheek. I do this by myself, but wrought iron cuts real nice and easy, so this isn't too bad. Could help myself or to turn the cutter the right way. And come on, Roy. Now I'm only going to go so far with this, so I don't want to damage Olga. Pretty sure I got that cut about right. And now we'll just tap that right off. Yep. Mike G asked, what part of the hammer is this? This is the cheek pieces of the hammer. You let me get this heated back up, I'll show you what I mean by that. And now we're ready to forge this out into the next cheek. Grab a pair of tongs. Nope. That's the way that works. Here you think you know what you need, and then it's seldom the thing that you need. And then it's gone the thing. <laughs> so here's the hammer right now as it sits. These are going to become the cheeks that are going to get welded on here. Now these, these cheeks are going to be decorative panels, and they're going to have a man's face forged into them. So they're going to have high chasing done. Hopefully that makes sense. I left myself just a little material proud here because this ends a little thinner. And so what I'll do is I'll get this back up to a nice welding heat again, a good forging heat, and then I'll dress this down nice and square or cube-like in a way, and then that should weld on there nicely. Again, this is a Scandinavian style cross peen sledgehammer. The Real Big Sweet says you should get your nephew from Florida, Roy. We do miss him. Yeah, little G's awesome, ain't he? He might come out and visit for a week uh, sometime this summer, so we'll have to have him out on a live stream if he's out here. Yeah. We'll have to tell him you missed him, too. He'll like that. Ryan Hillstell says, I'm going to have to sign out something about when the temperature hits 110, people drive crazy. Yeah? Yeah. <laughs> Might well be attention. Well, be careful, Ryan. Definitely sign out and come check back up on the stream if you can. So, by the way, just a real quick poll uh, in the comment section. Who has been enjoying this style of stream? I'm hoping everybody's been enjoying all the technology technology that's went into it and everything else like that, multi-camera angles. I really hope that's good for everyone. Um, let me know in the comment section how we're doing, if you guys are enjoying this. Oh, well, this piece gets heated up. 
Also, this would be a great time to segue over to the website, Jess. Yeah. The new website landing page. Yes. Yeah. Well, you guys, I was working on it. I'll let Jessica tell you a little bit about that. All right. While I keep this thing in heat. One moment. Let me make sure. Okay, there you guys. You can see it now. Um, so normally, when you went to blacksmithpdfs.com, it would just put you on our downloads page. And I realized that we technically have a lot more resources than we're offering than just the downloads. And so I made a little page for each of them. But right now we have a new landing page, and this is what it looks like. And you go to blacksmithpdf.com. And if you happen to navigate away from this page and you're trying to get back to it, uh, it's now up on our menu bar. It's this one here that just says blacksmithing. If you click on it, it'll bring you back to this page. But one of the one of the things I definitely want to point out on it is our calendar. This is our upcoming events uh, where we or Roy will be attending. And so we're going to the Rabbit Conference in uh, Burton Century Village uh, or Burton, Ohio. And that's going to be in about three weeks from now. And so the information for that is on the calendar page. I will be the conference demonstrator there. So I will be the main conference demonstrator. And what I will be demonstrating is two types of forged swedge blocks that you can make. And these are the swedge blocks of the kind. I did a video on this a little while ago. I don't know if I can go to that angle. Yes, let me change it here. There you go. They're this kind of swedge block. So I'll be demonstrating not only this swedge block at that conference, but I'll be demonstrating one with punched, with punched and drifted holes that are like the square and the rounds. Mm -hmm. The square and round holes for like a, a punch plate mm -hmm. type deal. But I'll be demonstrating that type of swedge block and this type of swedge block as well. So if you're looking for information on that, make sure to look under our calendar page and their website and the cost and all that stuff's included there. Um, so now if you're wanting to get our, to our digital, digital downloads, uh, it's this one here and that just puts you back on the normal page with um, the plans bundles and the individual plans and stuff like that. So it's still there, uh, it's just a new landing page now. Also, I put a link here where you can go to directly uh, to our merchandise on Teespring. And we've also added, um, we have one for consultations, one for ebooks. Uh, I have an area here for a blacksmith teacher. So if you have a um, group or if you're part of a blacksmithing club and uh, you would like them or you'd like to suggest that they host Roy as a blacksmithing teacher, there's kind of like a bio under this tab uh, so that you could reference them to it. Also, same, kind of same thing for a blacksmithing demonstrator. And then we have the recommended shop tools that we recommend from Amazon there as well. And last but not least, the YouTube video library, which since you're all here today, I'm sure you're familiar with our YouTube video library. Uh, but yeah, that's, that's the brief overview. And if you get a chance, um, I know we mentioned this on Monday night's live stream, but uh, if you get a chance, look over that, and we'd like to hear some feedback on what you think of the new website layout. So yeah. <laughs> yeah that's it. Uh, Mike G says, I love that little swedge block. I would love to have one like that. Yeah, they're a nice little, they're a nice little item. Um, they're fairly easy to forge once you've made the tooling to make them. Uh, and the tooling is pretty simple to make. So I did several part video series on that. And I think you watched those. I think you watched those. So you know I'm talking to the choir now. <laughs> um, preaching to the choir. Hammer Time New York says the merch is sweet. <laughs> awesome. Glad you like the merch. So you also didn't show them. I don't know if you show them. Show them. There's an Amazon affiliate link page there. Did you show them that? And on that page, if you like this shirt in particular, I've got it there, the people we bought it from. So yep. uh, be aware that is an affiliate link. So if you do purchase through that plug on that website, it gives us a small little kickback from Amazon on a small commission for directing traffic. Uh, the only things that I recommend on Amazon or in any affiliate link are the things that I use personally. So. It's what I use in my shop every day. Uh, I'm not into, not really into sponsorships. 
uh, unless somebody wants to sponsor me with a power hammer, and then you guys can take that with a grain of salt, you know, like a big old Nas L 4B or something like that. Well, then Roy's ethics may get questionable. So just for that, if, if you know that I'm being sponsored with a Nas L 4B hammer in my shop, don't trust a lick of anything I say out of my shop for about the next month or so. <laughs> Although I'm sure I can say all good things. What the Forge says, the new site setup is great, looks very professional and easy to navigate. Thank you. Awesome. Yeah, so that was all Jess. Mm. Alright, I think we're almost getting hot here where we can start forging on this, honey. Alright. So, pick it up just a little higher here. I want it nice and cooking. Dan Roswood says, I've been liking this style, mostly watching the reruns though. No assistance this time around, seems like a lot more work. Yeah, Dan. Uh, for those of you who don't know or had not catch last stream, Dan Roswood and Chirpy from Chirpy Tinkerings helped me get the billet welded up. Last live stream. It was a fun time. Had a great time with you, Dan. He was the guy who made you all jealous. <laughs> All right, we ready to go to the animal? Yes, we are. Okay, good? Yep. I'm ready. Pull this out. competition. This is my cheat. I'll use wrought iron. <laughs> That'll make everybody believe that Roy's a beast. Good. There we go. Hopefully everybody can see that. So now we're going to come out and we're going to bump this up on the surface of the anvil just like we did in prior times prior. We'll bring it out at a really high welding heat to do that and go ahead and slam it down in here and see how that goes. Questions? Comment, sugar, here. problems? Sure. Let me get good? Yep, we're okay now. Had one uh, non-family friendly person that uh, could no longer join us. Oh really? But we're good now. <laughs> Uh, Edge Gray Wolf says, does that shirt help you stay cooler? Uh, yes, it does. Uh, in my opinion, it does. Uh, it is a slightly heavier shirt. It's not as lightweight as probably what a linen shirt would be. It's my guess. But it's 100% cotton. Works good that way. And the, I think this... Just simply put, the way it helps me stay cooler is regular t-shirts kind of cling, kind of cling to me when I start sweating, and that just intensifies that heat right against my skin because they get wet, and then the fire bakes that wetness, and therefore just transfers that heat so much better. These stay really loose, so as I'm hammering, I almost get like a little puff of air, almost like it's, you know, if you take your shirt like that, so for me, I feel way more comfortable forging in this than I do in a regular t-shirt now. Now I'm really interested in trying the linen. I've heard that that's better. So we'll see how it goes. Dan Roswood says, I don't think my forging furnace could even get that size material up to that temperature. Never felt steel like the wrought iron. Nope. It was hot. Yep, no. Uh, yeah, so all the people that I'm collaborating with, this will be the fun challenge for all of them, is getting wrought iron hot. So wrought iron, I've spoke about this in other live streams, 
wrought iron likes to be hot. So if you saw at one time I brought it out and it was just a white ball of light, you know, it was throwing sparklers all over the place. That's at the top end of wrought iron's welding heat. So that's at the point where it starts to turn to a liquid. It can take that much heat and it loves it. If you've got a, if you've got a little delamination happen into it, you take it up to a fiery white heat like that, whack that thing shut, it's closed and it's never coming back. So it really likes to weld at really high, high, high temperatures. That being said, it also likes to be forged at above 2,000 degrees. So above 2,000 degrees. So where mild steel is like 2,200, right, or so, at the high end of mild steel, all the way down to right around 1,900, you can get a sticky heat, you know, about 1980. You get like this little sticky heat to them where they'll start to stick in the fire up to the top end, which is right around 2,200 degrees. That 2,200 degrees is basically that the forging temperature if you need to do a heavy cross-sectional changes like drawing out a tenon or uh, drawing out the material or doing any sort of upsets and things like that, that's the low end of that range. So wrought iron likes to be worked much, much hotter. So forge welding can be all the way up into the 26 uh, to about 26 to 2900 degrees depending on how thick the book, how, what the atmosphere is like and things like that. So it likes to be hot, very, very hot. And most gas forges can't cut it, most. There's a few, but most don't, can't cut it. Jonathan Pittman had a question. He says, why didn't you forge both cheeks then cut in half? Uh, basically because it was getting it was getting longer than what I was wanting I just wanted to cut the cheek off so I have something to aim for the second one so versus trying to measure them out divide them in exactly in half and cut them all off on the bar I just wanted to forge that out to about where I want it check it against the hammer that I said okay that works out good so now I'll make my other one to the exact same specifications as that one is and now they'll both be exact if you can cut them you can guess at it so get the width of the bar that you want and get approximately the length of the bar you want and then cut those off at a later date I would suggest doing that cold uh, you know that way you can be accurate with your layout but since I can't be as accurate when I'm using a chisel to cut across, I'd rather take and do it where I do a piece at a time. And that way, if I screw one up, well, pitch it, and I didn't screw two up at the same time. It just it, You can do it either way, basically. What's up? Uh, nothing. I, was, I heard little crackling noises. I was just hoping your metal wasn't burning. Oh, no. No. It's fine. OK, you're good. It's almost at the tip now that I can go ahead and bump it up. You ready? Yes, I'm ready. All right, we're going to bring this out. We're going to go ahead and bump it up. That's going to get us some thickness that we need. That's going to help us get some width into the piece. We want to get some width out of this bar. So I'm using the cross pin of the hammer. Draw this out wide. Now the flat of the hammer. And now it's a little too cool to work. I'm going to just finish planishing this up a little bit. do too much cross-action change at this heat because it will split on you. And if you have a low grade of rod iron, you're going to have to keep working at a lemon yellow the whole entire time. And I do mean lemon yellow the whole time. Because if you do anything but lemon yellow, it's going to split on you. Mm -hmm. So, 
be careful of that. But right here, I don't know if you can see it. This is where I was starting to work it too cold. See a crack? Oh, yeah. That's not a crack. That's a delamination. I'm separating the iron from the silica. It's cracking along the silica in the grain structure. So that's a small delamination. That can be fixed just by bringing it up to a white heat and forge welding it back shut. No problem. So this I'm going to bring up at a really nice big bright heat so this way I don't get any sort of delam in it whatsoever. And I'm going to go ahead and finish shaping this out at a really bright, bright heat. So that way I can make sure I'm not getting any delam in here. Because when I cut it off, I don't want to have to deal with that at a later date. This drop off into two pieces. Thank you, Mr. Thing. <laughs> Thing Adams. Let's see. Uh, Jason Satterwhite says, I found two wagon wheels at the scrapyard, but wasn't sure if they were wrought iron or not. They were very rusted and pitted, so how can I tell? Uh, if you want them and you want to test them, I would just buy them. One of the easiest ways to check for wrought iron to see if it is wrought iron is to take and if you can bring it home, put a little hack mark in it, like take a little small saw cut and then whack it. Whack it in the post vise and what will happen is it will split at that saw cut and it will bend. It will bend over and it will look almost like string cheese you know you got wrought iron. Uh, now if it's a really, really fine grain wrought iron, it won't look like string cheese. It's going to look, it's still going to tear. It won't just snap. If it is a mild steel or something of the like, it'll just snap across that homogenized grain structure. Uh, with the fibrous grain structure, it peels. It'll peel off, whether it looks like string cheese or not. Uh, if it looks like string cheese, you got fairly coarse raw iron. You shouldn't in wagon material, uh, but it should kind of like, like I said, it should kind of stretch and kind of like peel off versus just snap clean. If it snaps clean, it's not raw iron. One of the other ways you can check if they'll allow you to do it is take, a, take an angle grinder to the scrapyard with you with a flat disc and grind a little notch in it. And if you grind into it and the sparks come out and they're just straight as an arrow with no little clusters at the end, no little firecrackers, at the end, it's pretty sure you've got wrought iron. It'll have a low amount of sparks and they'll be just straight streaks for the most part. Jason says, cool thing, so I'll give it a try. Yep. That's awesome. Find if they're wrought iron, you got a lot of wrought iron there in a the wagon wheel. Mm -hmm. There's a lot of rot that you do. And you could make a hammer just like I'm making a hammer. All you have to do is just bend it back on itself till you got enough of a billet, you know, enough mass, fag it, weld it up, and just forge weld it all together. And there you go. You're right into it. Remember, work it really hot. North, Con North Country, Country Forge, excuse me. Thank you for the $2 super chat. North Country Forge, thank you so much. And Techronmatic also gave us a $10 super chat. Thank you, Techronmatic. I appreciate that. God bless you. And asked along with that, Roy, have you ever considered forging a decent sized anvil? And if so, would you use raw iron for the body? Uh, so, yes, I have. I have considered doing a decent size anvil before. Um, it is one of my projects I have in mind for the future. It's going to be a while out though. Uh, I'm hoping to make Olga a smaller sister at some point in time. Mm -hmm. So, uh, but... Hel what was it? Helga? Yeah, a Helga, if you will. Make a Helga. Um, but we'll get more into that later on in the year, hopefully in the future. We'll see little spoiler alert there but uh, yeah I would use the I would use wrought iron for the body yes I uh, since I have it I have about I have approximately it's a small supply but I have about 170 pounds of it so 
right around there. I don't know what I actually have because I haven't weighed it here recently uh, since I've been using off of it. But at one time it was a little over 170 pounds that I had, 175, 178, something like that. So I think I've got 170-ish pounds left over. So with that being said, wrought iron just forge welds so nice. It just forge welds so nice. And you know, you get a gang of guys going together at that thing, forge welding, no problem. You can beat a whole ham you can beat a whole anvil together the size of Olga with just a few people. You know, if you've got something that you can lift it out of the fire and a fire big enough to heat it up to welding temp, you can forge an anvil every bit as big as Olga out of wrought iron with just a few people. So it'll be a long day. No, oh, yeah. It'd be a long, probably 18 hour stretch. You do a lot of sweating until you dehydrate. <laughs> yeah. But still a lot of fun. Tachronomatic says, sounds awesome. Can't wait to see it. And thank you for the $10 super chat. To everybody who donated super chats, make sure everybody gives them a hand clap in the comment section. After this yeah, next little much. welding heat here, an adjustment of shape. I'm going to take and read off all of our supporters over the last few months. Uh, less the people who are supporting in this stream, you'll be in the next stream. You'll have a nice another honorable mention there. Uh, but we're going to take one more good heat on this, bring it up, get the last little bit of fidgety shaping done, and we'll see where we're at. Uh, I'm going to get this, bring this down so I can check it out, so I can compare size. Always good to do that, if you can. That way I know it's the right size for me. We are almost there to the welding heat. So one of the one of the jobs that I had to come in, and I don't know if there's any comments, honey, that need a direct answer for. You can go ahead and stop me anytime. Okay. But uh, one of the jobs I had coming in here recently, which I'm very excited about getting to, and it's going to make this hammer look like chunk change, is a 30 pound sledgehammer. So somebody wants me to create them a custom 30 pound sledgehammer with all the fixings. Uh, I say all the fixing is, is a lot of chase work, chasing work and things like that. I'm hoping to do some sort of video on it. Uh, at least I'll do, put some pictures on Instagram and maybe a, just a few pictures on the community tab and I might just do a walk around in the hammer. I don't know how much the process I'll actually film or not because it is a client's job uh, and so you know sometimes I don't show my client's work that I'm working on this thing's interesting enough, I may ask him if it's okay if I make a little vlog about it and, and we'll see where we go with it. But it'll be a 30 pound sledgehammer. No. Yep. A big one. <laughs> a real big one. All right. Don't bring this out. We're ready to go, okay? Okay. You good? Yep, we're good. Out we go. Nice bright heat. says 30 pound sledge. Is this guy half grizzly bear or something? <laughs> <laughs> Might be. He's not going to be using it to forge. Basically, he is, I don't know if it's a part of the circus or the carnival. You know, honey? No, I'm not sure. Uh, I don't know if it's carnival or circus that he's into, but it's for one of those type games where you hit and ring the bell. It's one of those things. Mm -hmm. so I'm going to go ahead and get this lined up here. They ask, is it, who's it for, Roy? Thor? <laughs> might be. He might have called up. I wouldn't know. He get the same treatment as everybody else. It's called the wait list. 
Paul Bunyan. <laughs> That's a good guess, Kevin McIntyre. Alright, take another heat on that. Hmm? You basically got that ready to go. That's about the same size and dimension, which is great. We'll take one more heat on that and get that cut off. Alrighty. By the way, thank you all, everybody, so much for being a part of this stream. You really do help the channel by being here. Uh, thank you, everyone, who has supported this stream tonight uh, with, your, with your super chats. However big or however small, every one counts. Every last one of them counts. They allow us to do things like this um, and uh, make them more cost effective and allows us to get better equipment uh, to do streams and bring in more camera angles and you name it, things like that. And we do greatly appreciate that. And thank you everybody who's contributing to that. You guys are awesome and I don't say that lightly. I don't say that lightly at all. So, uh, can I have that? Yes. Yeah. She's focusing on a spider yeah. right now a spider. on the line. It landed uh, like a foot away from me. So. All right. So uh, here's our last 30 days of Super Chat. We have had Graham Pepper, Jason Sullivan of Shamrock Forge, Energy Management, Gordon Family Forge, Coffee's Forge, Rishi Sund, D. Thomas, County Line Forge, I think everybody knows him, for the Honor Forge, Billy Strong, uh, Paul Ellis, at, or Ciliop, as we all like to affectionately <laughs> call him, <laughs> and Tim over at Big Dog Forge. Thank you all so much. Make sure you guys give them a hand clap in the comment section. We do appreciate you. Thank you for supporting the stream and uh, what we do here. We really do appreciate that. Let's see here. Swim baiting Ohio. Uh, Roy gets his coal from Southern Ohio Forge and Anvil. Yep, I get it from Silva. And there's another question on about how much do you go through a day? Uh, how much coal? Okay, so that's a hard one to define for me, so I'm probably going to give a different answer every time. <laughs> <laughs> um, I know I've answered it a couple times in the past, uh, but it really varies on the day. If I have a day where I'm doing nothing but coal forging, I got a lot of hammers or something like that I'm doing, uh, or a lot of tooling work that I'm putting through the forge, things like that, I can. It's not uncommon for me to go through 50 pounds in a day, 50 to 100 pounds of coal a day. Now that's if I am really going after it in this forge. Most of the time, not that much. A good 20 pounds or so, 20 or 30 pounds would last you all day for small work and things like that. Uh, and you would still have fire left over for maybe even a second day. So you could probably say maybe 10 to 15 pounds of coal a day at max. Now, like I said, that number is going to change for me a lot. Basically, if I've got something to feed in the gas forge and I need production where I need to be able to shove a bunch of billets in, get them hot while I'm over here welding or grinding or doing something else, then I come back and I forge a bit under the power hammer or the press, and then again, and I, and I just keep that cycle, that workflow going in my shop, then I don't use a whole heck of a lot of coal those days, those weeks, those months, because I'm using more gas than I am coal. So it all depends on uh, the project at hand. It all depends on the project at hand. Uh, when I'm doing traditional work, about 50 pounds on average, you can say I go through per day uh, of forging. That's green coal, not coke, but green coal. Let's see, we received two more dollars, two more super chats. Uh, five pounds. Awesome. Five pounds from Peter Tricker says, good show, Roy. Thank you, Peter Tricker. Appreciate it. God bless you. Thank you for the five pound super chat. I appreciate that. And what the forge for two dollars says, wish I could do more, smiley face. What the forge, it's perfect. All right, brother, thank you so much. Your two dollars will be spent very wisely and put to good use here uh, to bring better and better streams. So thank you all so much. Thank you, thank you. Bye. 
So one thing you'll find on my channel is I respect everybody who does super chats or, or donates through PayPal or, or you know, buys power hammer plans from us and, and things like that to support the channel. Uh, you know, I really do respect your guys' money. It's your hard-earned income and you're giving a portion, you're making that choice to give a portion to a guy that's standing up here sweating and trying to entertain you, right? And I know there's a lot of channels out there, uh, not necessarily blacksmithing, but you know, that are like in the mainstream kind of YouTube, that you know, they go, oh, thank you for your support. And it's kind of like, they're, maybe they're not being genuine, right, with that thank you. It's just kind of like, it's a, like an automated response to you giving them money. They have to say, Thank you. I've been on a few streams before, and it was kind of, it kind of felt like that, kind of like it was like, I gave you five bucks or ten bucks to tell you I appreciated you, and you're like, oh yeah, that's great, thanks, and they just kind of like move on, you know, beyond my question or or uh, my comment or something like that. And so, you know, just to let you know, I do respect every dime that you guys take and donate to the channel to allow us to continue to do this. I do. So Jessica does. I do. Every time you guys, every time we see somebody out and about wearing one of our Christ Center Ironworks merchandise shirts, it just makes a smile. You know, yeah. uh, it, it's, it's kind of funny because it's like, it's like, oh, it's like a little bit of stardom or something. You know, it's, it's weird. It's just, it's really weird. Mm -hmm. You know, I went from a little over a year ago, basically being fairly obscure in my work, and you know, I've put a lot of I've put a lot of ironwork out, a lot of pieces and things, and then, you know, it's like in the last year or so, there's more people who know me than the what I know them, right? Like, there's more people who know about me or say, "Hey, you're that guy," and I'm like, uh, "What I do this time, right?" <laughs> and and uh, then we get to talking, and it's like, "Oh, okay," you know, and. And stuff. So, you know, before no one wanted to hang out with Roy. Now I've got constant emails where people want to come visit and come to the shop mm -hmm. and spend the day with me. And, uh, you know, it really does, it, it humbles It humbles me a lot and it kind of like, I don't know, it's, it's, it, it's an interesting place to be in, being on YouTube and having a bunch of sub subscribers and things like that because there's a big responsibility I feel towards that. And that's why we're always trying to bring you better and better stuff like streams because, you know, here you have wasted on your Friday night, uh, you know, two hours or an hour. Listen to me saw it on about whatever, right, while my metal's heating up. It's like, get to the point, bro, like, it's hot, right? But, uh, and I will, I will, I will here in a second. I just wanted to get that off my chest that, you know, thank you for the time that you spend with Jessica and I on Friday nights and the time that you spend to watch the videos and to leave comments and to leave encouragement and positivity uh, on the daily. Uh, we know that that takes something from you and that's a sacrifice on your part of time and it's a sacrifice whenever somebody donates money and so you know that's a sacrifice of your finances and it is greatly appreciated and it is respected here on my channel. I can't speak for anybody else's channel out there. There's a lot of great ones. But I know personally, I can speak from my channel, it is greatly, greatly appreciated. And it's very humbling. Thank you. Enough of that. <laughs> I'll shut up now, I promise. For a minute. What the Forge says when you quit saying wasted. This is not wasted time. This is the highlight of my week other than forging. Oh, good. I'll try to stop saying wasted time. <laughs> Alright, ready? Uh, yes. Let's go back to the anvil. Okay. I'm going to give this thing a few more pops before I cut it off. Make sure she's good and square. Hold it between the legs. Again, I love how wrought iron does this. Rod iron is so easy to work with. All right. And 
I don't know where to hang those, so I'm just going to hang them right there. Do, 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 do. There we go. So now we can set this bar aside. Now we don't need it anymore. To set it under the forge. That's how I started the bad habit of doing that in the first place. <laughs> So there we go, there's our second cheek piece. Now that piece got a little thinner than the other one, not by much, they're pretty close. They're pretty close to one another in thickness and in width, which is good. There we go. Mm -hmm. There's our cheek pieces ready. Now the last part that we need to do is I need to put a small chamfer on all four edges here because we need to create ourselves a welding plane and not a shear plane. So I'm going to explain what that is here in a second. Get that down. I'm going to rebuild the fire for a second. And we are almost done with tonight's live stream anyhow. Hour and 25 minutes in. Hour and 25 minutes in. All right. We've had a lot of encouraging comments from everybody just saying how great of a teacher you are and they enjoy learning and spending spending that time with us uh, being able to learn good thank you all so much it is it is my pleasure it is my pleasure to even have the opportunity to teach it, it is it is my pleasure so thank you very much and brave skin thank you for the twenty dollar super chat brave skin you're awesome thank you thank you so much also, he said, agree with What the Forge. I'm really enjoying the content of your streams, and we're learning a lot from watching. Thank you for taking the time. You are very welcome. Thank you so much again for your hard-earned money. We greatly do appreciate it. Uh, now, before I get all sentimental, what was I doing? Oh, this is what I'm doing. <laughs> Sorry. I'm going to draw this out real quick where I can see it, and I'm going to turn it up to where you can see it. See that? Yes, let me zoom it out just a fuzz. Yeah, maybe zoom it out and that way I can also might. Let me flip the screen out here. Hold on, ladies and gents. Get a little shaky cam there for a second. I gotta see what I'm doing. Okay. <laughs> so this way I don't have to keep pe peering over it. Mm -hmm. So what we need to create is we need to create a bevel. So we need to create a welding plane. Okay? So we want to create a welding plane. Man, that's hard, drawing a W upside down, okay? Versus a shear plane, okay? We're going to do that. I'm going to screw this up. S, is that correct? I don't know. Might yes. be backwards. Yes, you're fine. Is it correct? Okay. <laughs> Can't tell. I'm upside down here. So we want to create a welding plane, not a shear plane. And the reason for this being is a shear plane is going to cause material to suck down with it as it goes. And what that is going to create is a stress riser or a fracture of the material, almost shearing the material, if you will. A welding plane does not have a vertical that can suck down material. So a shear plane is like a cliff. A welding plane is like this taper. This is the reason why we have scarfs. We have scarves, so this way we don't have shear planes. We have welding planes in order to get a full weld up to the toe and be able to blend this material out into the hammer. If we were to forge in with this, what we would have once we start welding is we would have something that would pop down in there and resemble that. It would actually shear down into the bar as it welded. Okay, and so this would be the welded material down here, as where this will just weld out into the bar, like so. Hopefully that makes sense. Mm -hmm. Does that make pretty good sense there, yeah. honey? It yeah, looks it does. looked like it was coherent. Uh -huh. Okay, so we have to put a chamfer on this piece. Now, this piece is just going to be essentially jump welded on 
or what they would call a butt weld uh, if it was just two ends of bars being butted together. But this is what they call a jump weld. In this instance, you're taking a large bar and you're adding a smaller bit of bar to it. That is called a jump weld. You're jumping something onto the larger parent bar stock, okay? So you're adding two. So with that being said, we need to take and create that chamfer all the way around. Now, later on, we are going to forge this to where it has more of a sharp corner in here. So it stands out, so it has a better profile. But that will not be a shear plane. That will be dressing out that scarf and forging out that scarf to where we've got the transition that we're looking for. And I can try to wash this off and redraw that if I need to. But, by the way, the best way to remove soapstone on a drawing is with water, just like regular soap. <laughs> so, we need to remove. Can you draw on it though now? That's what. Yep. So, I'm draw that out again. So, draw that. This one in half. And that. Get welded up like that. Okay, boom. All right, so now we will no longer have a shear plane. What we will do is we will dress out this side. But that material still flowed together. That's still one piece. Mm -hmm. This is undressed, that is dressed. So once we dress it, it'll be a sharp corner. It'll look like it's just been stuck on there. But it's actually, it's actually kind of a mirage, because this is a cutaway, again, of this bar, right? It's actually a mirage because you've welded this in now, see? It's actually become part of that top layer of material. So this piece here will actually become part of the top layer of your material. That's how that'll work out, and it'll keep it all together. Mm -hmm. Hopefully that makes sense. So that's the reason why we're putting a chamfer on it. If anybody needs me to repeat anything, now's the time before I put my little clipboard away. There was, yes, there was a question. Um, is wrought iron still in production? Wrought iron is no longer in production. Uh, I don't know of anywhere that you can get it other than find it. There is a company over in Europe that sells a product called Pure Iron. It is not wrought iron. It is a homogenized material that is all iron, and it's very, very soft. It has no structural capability to it whatsoever, but it has a bunch of different alloys in it and things that leaves it to a bright, shiny finish when you're done forging. So it has high corrosion resistance, but it is a lot of this to have very little of it shipped to you here in the United States. Um, I have toyed around with the ideal of possibly importing some just to include it in my work. But again, the cost of that is so high that uh, I don't know if it's reasonably worth it. And I'm talking probably in the realm of about $1,500 just to get it here. Because you have to buy a load of it. Not only do you have to buy it itself, but then you have to pay an extreme amount of money to get it here because it has to be freighted. That means they put it on a container, a whole shipping container, and bring it over here. So, uh, very costly to bring it in. At one time, there was a guy here in Ohio that was having it hauled in when prices were a little reasonable, but uh, sadly enough, I think that guy has passed away. So he is no longer with us, so therefore he doesn't do it anymore. Um, But no, it is no longer currently in production. Jim Bob the Impaler says, so you're saying it's easier to find it then, eh? Yep, it's a way easier to find it. Um, you know, the best place, I, I think the best place in the world that you can probably find it is the scrapyard. If you can get a scrapyard to deal with you, say, hey, I'm an artist blacksmith, you know, I would love to take and be able to get some scrap. I know you guys don't deal with anything like that, but you know, public sales and whatnot, you know, but try to get on with somebody who knows somebody, who knows somebody, who has a friend with somebody that works at the scrapyard that can maybe get you in that backdoor approach. 
uh, because that is one of the best places to find wrought iron. Because like I said, you'll have gate and fence companies that will come out and they'll rip out miles of this stuff. Now the stuff for fence work is not as good quality, but it's still wrought iron. And they'll rip out miles of it without a second thought. Throw it in a heat, take it to the melters. They'll just take it and smelt it down. North Country Forge had mentioned, said, I do a lot of metal detecting. If you can find an old foundation, look around for the old farm dump. I found yep. lots of wrought iron in these. Okay, cool. Thanks for the hookup on that one. Mm -hmm. oh. uh, one other great place to find wrought iron, and chances are you guys are using these anyhow, a lot of you are. If you can obtain them legally, and I do express legally, stop cutting out sections of railroad track, okay? <laughs> stop pulling spikes up from, you know, the transit lines, okay? Uh, if you can find them legally, really old railroad spikes, like the one I've got here, are made of wrought iron. So this is a great way of finding wrought iron. This one, as you can see, it went like this and it tore basically before it broke. This railroad spike here is wrought iron. Sometimes they're, sometimes they're marked with a WR. Sometimes it's just an R. Sometimes it's an R and an H mixed together. Uh, but a railroad spike like this, this is wrought iron. So it forged out really easily under the hand hammer. So I knew real quick and I was just testing it basically to see if it was wrought iron and it is so something like this is a great way of finding them chances are you may you know a lot of people would be like i don't do work and i don't do work with railroad spikes right but i just happened to be gifted this uh by a fellow subscriber of the channel and uh i won't mention his name just in case he wants to remain nameless but uh i was given these railroad spikes and I got a whole pile of them, and pretty much they're all wrought iron. So that's awesome. Jim Bob the Impaler said, this is a repurposing type of material then. Old fences and, uh, let's see, old outdoor furniture, question mark, and barn metal. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. And yep. also asked, how old are we talking? Old as in at least 100 years old. 100 years plus. So... Um, you know, we're in 2000, 2018 now, right? Is that where we're at? Mm -hmm. Okay, so we're in 2018, so you're going to want to look again like, you know, 1918 kind of thing. That type of stuff. Uh, it kind of went out of style right around the 1930s. Um, basically, where the last one, anybody who was producing wrought iron and any import of it basically shut up in this country. Was it the 1920s to 1930s, we shifted away from wrought iron completely uh, in using it at any point and went completely to homogenized material then, mild steel, as we call it today. Or the early predecessor, I should say, to mild steel. Good. Tyler Anderson says, what's the best way to get your product sold? Uh, Tyler, we talk about this extensively on our Monday night live streams. We talk about yep. running a blacksmithing business. So if it's something you're interested in, make sure to stop in there. Uh, pretty much everything business related on Mondays. Um, yeah. You know, uh, one of our most recent ones was how to set up for craft shows. And so just bring any questions you have on that are business related. And uh, it's about two hours on a Monday evening. And uh, we'll talk about we'll talk about it there. Yep. Let's go to the anvil, Jess. All right. Okay. You're just good and hot here. I'm just going to forge down a bevel. This is going to become a scarf. And we're going to forge a little side bevel. You want to watch doing this too cold as well because you can split out a little in side grain on it. So you be careful with that. And that's probably about too cold there, but I'm going to give it a go. Although my wisdom tells me otherwise. Hey, yeah. Hey, yeah. Hey, time New York says, just curious, does raw iron lose a bunch of weight with all the squirting, or is that lightweight to begin with? Uh, yeah.
yes, it does lose quite a bit of its weight. Um, kind of, uh, it's kind of less weight and it's more mass. It's mass. You lose more of its mass than you do its weight. But there we go. So we're putting some chamfers on there. I'm going to go ahead and bring that out one more time. Get that hot again, bring it out one more time. And we'll be good to go. i just set that right in there. Um, what the fork says, Roy, what size bar would you recommend starting with for a one and three quarter pound hammer? Is this wrought iron or is it steel? I hate to meet a question with a question, but it kind of requires it. Yeah. Jim Bob the Impaler said, see you teaching more and more. Had to write all of that down on my notepad, LOL. <laughs> Good. So I just put in the anvil, I put a small radius edge block in here. This is just so this way I can thin out the toe of those scarves a lot better without having to take and hit, take the risk of hitting my anvil surface top. Now I was chastised by somebody in the comment section several months ago, like, because I like sharp edges on my anvil, and they like made a radius block, very confusing, kind of hypocritical type deal. Uh, so for this guy in particular, or anybody who has that kind of thought process, this is a tool. Uh, a tool helps you do things. The things that it helps you do is stuff that is like getting it off your anvil surface. I still support my sharp edge theory on my anvil for my type of work that I do. So, just to be clear, I'm bringing out the radius edge block not because I need the radius edges, just because I need the height and I don't want to bang up Olga on, it, on the face with my hammer. This will allow me clearance for the tip of the hammer so I can thin out the toe of the scarf. Eric Seeger says, good evening, Roy and Jess. What is the benefit of wrought iron? Um, so the benefit of wrought iron, let's go to the anvil one. Okay. Just drop that, why not, Roy? The benefit of wrought iron is the historical approach to it. That's one benefit of many. But my other benefit, I would say, of wrought iron is the fact that wrought iron is soft. It's very easy to move by yourself. So on a project like this, let's give you an example. On a project like this, it's very easy to move this wrought iron as where it would be a real pain. I'm forging this way too cold. It's okay. It'd be a real pain to try to move this if this was like 1095 or you know 1045 steel. It would be a real pain in the butt skis to take and do this out of a high carbon tool steel. Uh, my old steel does not like to weld as nice as wrought iron does, so there's another benefit there. You know, you kind of take it or leave it on that. If you don't have, if you don't have wrought iron, you can do this in mild steel just as well. Uh, obviously, you're going to work a little harder at it, and your welding temperatures are going to be lower, so that's better. That's better for most people if you have a gas forge and things like that. You can still apply all these principles there. Also, what do you use to etch the wrought iron? Uh, so, I'm going to use probably vinegar uh, to etch it. I'll put it in a hot vinegar bath and let it bubble away at it for a few hours. Do something like that with uh, vinegar. I've used, I may try the muratic acid again. I did get some muratic acid for the small one, the little small hammer, but I really dislike the fumes that came off of it. I, did, I don't like chemicals. I don't like chemicals that can uh, get in your lungs and mess you up. So that's a little bit, uh, not so sure on that one. I'll use muratic again. So. Plus, I don't like chemicals. My kids are older now. They don't wander too much in the shop. So, But they used to kind of be around and wander about and stuff. 
and you know sometimes I'd leave my doors open, go inside, get a drink or something, come back out. Kids were playing in the yard. I just didn't want acids, heavy acids, sitting around the shop that could potentially get one of my kids. So, Jim Bob the Paler, um, yeah, the the wrought iron looks neat when it's etched. The wrought iron Roy has is actually very fine grain though, and when he uh, when yep. he etched his little hammer that he just finished on the previous set of live, stream, live streams, there was actually only a few striations that you could see in the metal. Uh, surprisingly, I thought it would have been a lot more defined, but it's like I said, it's very, very refined metal for wrought iron. And also the question about the hammer is going to be made out of 1045 for a one and three quarter pound. One and three quarter pound, 1045. It would be my suggestion that you start with a piece that's about an inch and a half in dimension by about three and a half to four inches long. Hopefully I answered that okay. Yes, yes you did, yeah, thanks guys for bringing that back up again. I know the, it took me a little bit to get back around to that question. Uh, yes, we get our coal from SOFA, Southern Ohio Forge and Anvil, located in Troy, Ohio. All right, come on you, there we go. Drop forging things. All right, now I'm just squaring these up a little bit. Now in the case of this, you don't have to have the scarfs really thin, too thin. Here, you don't have to have the scarves down too thin on this portion. You can leave them a little thicker. That's not going to create a problem with the shear plane because we are going to be bringing this up really, really hot. And then we'll thin out the toe of that scarf. When we weld it in, we'll weld out this way, like so with the cross pin. When we actually weld it in, or on the heel of the hammer, kind of like the edge of the hammer, and that'll feather that in nicely. It leaves a little extra meat because we're dealing with something that's this thick at a full welding heat, and then attaching something like this to it. So hopefully you guys can see that. So basically the other one's just done the same, and I can start on that one. Or how was our time looking? Uh, we're one hour and 47 minutes in. Okay, well, I'll go ahead and do the other one for this live stream, and then that's where we'll call it for the evening. Getting those prepped. I hope everybody enjoyed this stream so far. I think so. We got 63 people sticking around still. Awesome. Good to have all 63 of you. Thank you for being here. Tyler Anderson had a question. Go Said, ahead, Tyler. I just went through my bucket of railroad spikes. They have an H on it. Is that anything special or just standard iron? They have an H. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that they are a standard. I think that's just a standard denominator. Um, if they have a, an HC to them, they have a higher carbon content in them. If they are just a standard H, I believe, I believe, I could be wrong on this. Somebody can correct me in the comment section. Uh, but I think H just H is a indicator of just a plain or a regular um, regular railroad spike. Now some of them you'll find that H is not an H and it's a W. So double check that to make sure that it's an actual clear defined H but it may be an actual W on there. If it's a W it's most likely wrought iron. Um, Rock Mike, I believe, believe asked if you have to, uh, the muriatic acid, if you water it down or dilute it, that's the word. Do you have to dilute it or? Yeah, do you have to dilute it? To uh, dilute it? no, you don't dilute the muriatic acid. In fact, it doesn't like water very well at all. Um, you can, you can use that to neutralize it, uh, but water and muriatic acid pouring, you can pour muriatic acid I believe it is, you can pour muriatic acid into water, you can't pour water into muriatic acid. Mm -hmm. um, creates an explosive reaction, you don't want that. Um, so basically just follow the directions on the judge, the, the jug, if you will. 
Mm -hmm. uh, I haven't read up on it. It was my first time really using it to etch anything. So I can't say that I know a whole lot about that when it comes to that. I'm going to give you a water here. Yeah, sure. Uh, swim baiting Ohio, would 4140 be a good steal for punches? Yes, it can be a good steal for punches if properly heat treated. Um, so know your heat treating on those type steels. I personally like simple steels. Uh, my, all my punches, from what I've been told, out of truck or coil springs, car springs, and things like that, is 5160. So I use that for most of all my chisels, chasing chisels, and whatnot. Uh, also, if you can get something like a, a higher carbon tin series, like a 1095 or a 1084 steel, those can be a good carbon steel to do punches and chisels and things out of. They make really great drifts, stuff like that. Um, when it comes to hot work, you have to design them a little thicker because with the carbon steels, they do have a tendency to draw that heat pretty quick. They're not like the steels that have chromium in them and vanadium and all the other different types of idioms and imiums and all that other type stuff in them. Um, they're not like those steels or the alloy-based steels where they can take more heat, so to speak. So you have to kind of cool them more often and design them just a little thicker than what you would maybe something like a 4140 or a 5160 or something like that. Let's see, there's another question for you. Uh, one moment. Oh, Koyshire. Roy, speaking of past live streams, what's the status of the handheld filing vice? Okay, so the status is basically where we had our crash. Um, the last live stream, we were working on doing the barbell for the screw of the vise, and I got that mostly welded up. It still needs to be refined and a few more forge welds taken on it. So it's been shelved. Um, most likely, right now as it sits, it's gonna be shelved until the end of summer. We'll get back on that come the fall uh, to winter time frame. We'll get back at that vise. The uh, reason why is because I'm making this vise and it's going to be very, very decorative. And we are at the point now where a screw up now puts me back a whole lot of live streams. So it'll take me way back to having to make everything all over again or make a component completely from scratch. So now it's time to kind of pucker up a little bit and mm -hmm. hold on for the ride, right? So uh -huh. uh, I don't have the time to do that. In these, in these next couple months. I know that sounds silly. Something like this wrought iron hammer, it's a bigger piece, I can get it hot. I kind of, there's a little less thinking for me than the fine fiddly bit that's gonna be on that to do all the chasing work and all the engraving work that I'm going to be doing on it. So we're kind of at that stage where I've got a lot of hand filing to do. I've got a lot of engraving and a lot of chasing work to do on it after Basically, that barbell is done. So, who knows? I might surprise you all and just throw it in there one week. Yeah. But most you likely, look at it for it in the fall. Mm -hmm. It's just kind of one of those ongoing projects. I think you started it back in the winter. Yeah. Back in the winter. Or it might have even been before Christmas. I'm not sure. Yep. Let's go to the anvil, Jess. All right. Hopefully, I can see that anvil walk. Fine. Oh, yeah, it's fine. Again, just putting a little short rough chamfer on it. We're just making that scarf, thinning it down, dress that. So if you have a low quality grade wrought iron, at this temperature it would already be splitting on you. Higher grade wrought irons you can take and work thinner. So if you can find any sheet iron that's wrought iron, that's going to be really high grade stuff. In 
fact, I just did a video on this of how to tell what you got in wrought iron. And uh, I just did a video. I hope that it's going to be a good one that everybody's going to enjoy. But I share a lot in that video and the thought process behind finding using wrought iron because not all wrought iron is created equal. And the reason why is just like how we have modern grades of steel, right? We have modern grades of steel. We have, they used to have grades of wrought iron. So the grade of wrought iron would depend on what it was going to be used for. Uh, if you were going to build a boiler for a steam engine out of a sheet of wrought iron, you wouldn't want that thing to have any delaminations anywhere in it, would you? You'd want it to be solid, right? Uh, same thing if you were going to be in a ship. If you live in a coastal area, you are in a prime location to find wrought iron. Um, in chains and anchors and ship hulls and, you know, you name it. I mean, it's going to be rusty and crusty because it's nasty on the seashore, right? But a lot of times you find wrought iron that still exists and still lasts, right? And if it's not a historical thing, a lot of times you can get a hold of it. Uh, but it had to take and withstand the rigors of the ocean, right? Being on an ocean liner or whatever. Uh, so, you know, think a little bit about what was this used for. Uh, ornamental wrought iron was usually typically a little lower grade wrought iron than stuff that was structural, like bridges or buildings or things like that. Uh, the little horse and buggy that went down the road, right? That had to be made from a higher grade wrought iron because those, those rims were taking shock, right, as they come flopping down the road and hitting rocks and you name it, right? That had to be higher grade. Uh, horseshoes, a pretty low grade of wrought iron. Usually horseshoes were not a very high grade of wrought iron. Uh, nails, again, not a very high grade of wrought iron. Um, you know, they are wrought iron, but they're not a high grade of wrought iron. So because they didn't have to be. It was a horseshoe nail. Why would you buy, you know, like, why would you buy Damascus steel and then make a dinner fork out of it, right? Like, or why would you buy something super expensive? Take one of Alex Steele's, you know, masterfully done pattern welded billets of whatever and then like, you know, forge a, a sock puppet out of it, right? Or something like that. Or put it on the bottom of a horse or make a bridle or a bit out of it. That wouldn't make sense. So though they reserved the lower grades of wrought iron for lower grades of work, or lower things that weren't high stress or things that did not require um, the iron to be of a high grade. So if you're looking for high grade, really nicely forged wrought iron, again, beggars can't be choosers on this, so get whatever wrought iron you can get, and you can refine it a lot. But Again, if you're looking for really good quality rot, you have to think of what it came from. That kind of that kind of tells you what type of rot you're going to be working with right off the bat. This particular rot was bridge wrought iron. So it came from a bridge, and you know they're not going to put junk in a bridge. Uh, at least you'd hope not, and if they did, it probably wouldn't last the hundred years or so that it was around for. So. All right, we're good to go. Uh, yep. Yeah. Good, it's good. Grant says, I'll stick with modern steel. Oh, come on, Grant. At least you know what to expect, right? Yep. Mike G says, I'm less than an hour away from the ocean. I might have to hunt for some wrought iron. Yeah, and you never know where you can find it. So, you know. Alright, so all we're doing is just trying to square this up, pretty it up. This is basically done. Car. <laughs> and this is too low of a heat to do any sort of material change. This is just planishing right now. And 
it, you can see it's really dark. This was a low grade wrought iron. Any hit at this temperature would split. So you'd have to work at a much higher heat than this. Now, speaking of picking your wrought iron, so I know that, let's see if we can grab it here. This bar is higher quality wrought iron. Let me take up this ISO a bit. And she zoomed me in. You can zoom my background if you have to. There you go. Yeah, that's better. So I know that this bar of wrought iron here is going to be of an even higher quality than the other thicker wrought iron. Let me grab that. That was for the larger portions. It's what we made the hammer out of, right? Mm -hmm. So I know that this round wrought iron is going to be a higher grade. Can anybody take a guess why? I was going to say, the, squ the square one looks like it has a lot smoother of a finish on the surface. Uh -huh. Well, why would the round one be of higher grade than the rectangular one? Give them a second to think about that one. Okay. Wait and see if we get an answer. Yeah. We got Manga 12 on there talking about history lessons on railroads. <laughs> <laughs> Give them that history, Manga. Ed Gray Wolf says make into a tool or an item for the round. Was that a guess? Mm -hmm. Yep. That it was for tools? Yep, made for tools or for an item. Nope, this comes from the bridge. This is the same bridge. Why would this be higher grade? David Olheiser says darker rust color. <laughs> Gray and pepper, more etching and invo stretching involved. More stretching. More stretching involved. That's a good guess. Still not there. We're getting there, though. Uh, Eric Seegers, can I see the end of the round bar? The Baca maker, it had to be forced through a board. Granddad's forge says round is weaker. The Baca maker says and was compressed. B and B oh. forge says size or what was used for. Well, he took the real broad open approach, but I'll give you a hint. It's what it was used for is the reason why this is a higher grade wrought iron than what the rectangular one is. Manga 12 says round would be more forged. Oh. Cockatoo Birdman Bill says the round was used for support. Frank Strock says support rod. Yep, so so you're getting it getting it very, very close. So this here, okay, this is kind of what the frame was made out of. This is what you would see just kind of like the trestles. There was a bunch of these, right? But these here are tensioning bars. They're meant to hold tension. In fact, I've got one that's got threads cut on it. And they were meant to hold and pull tension on the bridge. Yeah, actually, Ed Christine, you said that just before you said that. Uh, you did. He, his guess was it was because it was a weight-bearing piece like a suspension rod. Yep, yep, it's a suspension rod, basically. It's a tension bar. So basically, this thing would be really long, but it would be threaded on both ends, and it was pulled tight, right? And it put the bridge under load. You know how bridges have that arc to them? And they're not flat like this, they're not just flat across. That would put that structure under a positive load. So this way, as weight was applied to it or the weight of the bridge leans down on it, it levels out and goes flat, right? It's still got a slight arch, but they can take the load then and distribute it into the soil on the bank on each side. That's what this was made for. So its purpose dictates that this had to be a higher grade bar of wrought iron than what this is. Aaron Dennis said the round bar could have been extruded under far more pressure. Yes, it could have been as well. This could have been rolled um, through a die, extruded, pulled through a mandrel type die. There's a lot of different ways that they kind of produce this. A lot of times it was rolled. Uh, if it is rolled, it'll be a little more ovular shape than round, though. You'll notice that about it. It'll have a little more oval-like shape to it if it's been rolled. 
that that many years ago. Okay, we're talking really old time. But since this is almost perfectly round, it was probably pulled through mandrel or pulled through a die plate to refine it down even further. Or, well, not just one die plate, but a whole series of die plates. Big Dog Forge says a suspension rod. Yep, suspension rod. So this had to take more strain than what this did. This had a thousand members just like it. This, there was a lot less of them, and they needed to do more of the work to hold the whole structure up. So this is a higher grade, this is a lower grade, and therefore I chose because I'm wanting to chase a face into the side of this. By the way, hello, Tim at Big Dog Forks. Good to have you here. <laughs> Didn't see you come in, sir. But this first comment. <laughs> basically, this here, I had to take and I wanted to have something that I knew wouldn't have hardly any delaminations in it. I wanted to have really fine grain rod iron. I didn't want it to get all uh, uh, very fibrous looking at all. I want it to be very, very fine grain because I'm going to be taking a chisel basically and cutting into it and carving a face into this, into the cheek pieces. So I needed to make sure that I was going to be able to do that and not be able to split out a chunk of rod iron all of a sudden because I hit a coarse grain. Now, this is still really fine grain rod iron for what it is here, okay? It's really good rod iron, but this has more fibrous nature to it than what this bar does. This bar would almost, can almost, if you were to weld well on it, you didn't know any better, you would think that this is like a mild steel or almost a homogenized steel if you weren't paying real close attention. Hammer Time New York has a good question. Could yep. the lower grade be made into a higher grade if worked more? Yes. Yep, it can. So I can go back up to the main thing. So. Okay. Oh. Yes, uh, to answer that question, yes, it can. A lower grade wrought iron can be made into a higher grade. Usually it requires quite a few forging heats, quite a few forge welding heats, and reduction of material size. So say you need, so say you get a big chunk like this, right? But it's fibrous as all get out. What you can do is you can work it down to a smaller bar, cross section. That's going to, in a sense, refine it more. Then chop that bar up and restack it, fag it, weld it like this and then draw it back down to this type cross-section and you will have a much higher refined grain rod iron. As long as your welding abilities are there to be able to forge weld, which they should be, um, I'm a firm believer just about anybody can forge rod iron uh, if you bring it up to a white sparkling heat. Bring it up to white sparkling heat, this stuff practically melts together without a whole lot of fuss. Um, so. That's, that's kind of the differences. You know, wrought iron is a very interesting thing. And now, granted, I am nowhere close to being as good with wrought iron as I would like to be. I do know quite a bit about it because I've done a lot of observation. I've learned from guys who's worked with it quite a bunch. And so, therefore, uh, you know, that's where my information comes from. I'm sure there might be some guy out there that works with it all the time and you know maybe he has a completely different viewpoint in the way to take and actually go about working with it. But from my observations, this is what I know about it. And it generally stands true to reason. If you look at the wrought iron and you think about what it was used for, you put the historical context behind it, you can find some really good grades of wrought iron out there. I saw somebody's... Uh, Somebody did, I don't know if it was an Instagram post where I saw it. I want to say it was on Instagram. I saw somebody and they had a really, really, really fibrous looking wrought iron. And that's a really low grade wrought iron. And I mean, it had, I mean, it looked like a tree. It had more bark mm -hmm. than my trees do on them. And, uh, you know. That could be cool for ornamental pieces. Yeah, which it can be really awesome for ornamental pieces. If you etch wrought iron a really, really long time, you can get that. But with fine grain, like what I've got here, you won't really get that that much. It's, you might see some small striations, um, but you're not going to get the big, heavy, wooded look, right? 
So in some cases, ornamental, for the ornamental side, that's what Jessica was saying, you kind of beat me to the punch, was oh, getting sorry. there. <laughs> but for the ornamental side of things, maybe you want that heavy grain look, right? You want that real fibrous nature. And in that case, you want to look for coarse iron to you do can that. You make with. a tree sculpture out of it. Yep, there's been guys who've done that. There's a guy at Quad State. Uh, he's there every year. He comes down with, uh, <coughs> now I'm going to forget his name, guy who makes hammers all the time. Aaron Serbel. Aaron Serbel or Kriegel. Kriegel or Serbel, I can't know how to pronounce his last name. Um, but he comes down with them every time. They're usually right on the front row area. And he likes making dragon heads and all sorts of stuff out of wrought iron. And he likes to etch them like crazy. He makes hummingbirds and you name it. And they come out with this really wood grain look to them. And again, that's a lower quality iron. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, he did get that from like a railing, uh, like a gate project that somebody was ripping out he got that off of that. And so that was a lower grade wrought iron, but for the ornamental side of things, it was beautiful. It's what you expect wrought iron to look like on the inside. Well, honey, we're, there you go. we're about two hours and 15 minutes in. Two hours and 15 minutes. I made it longer than what I thought I would. Uh, I hope I imparted enough information here for you. Uh, if you get a chance to get wrought iron, do not stray away from it. Uh, you will not be sorry that you've messed around with it and played with it. It's just all about understanding your material. Like anything in this craft, you need to understand the tools and the materials that you're using. And once you get a good foundation in your fundamentals and stuff, it can go, you, you can take it just as far as you want. But I hope this project we're working on here will inspire you to get out in your own shop and, you know, try new things. You know, undertake bigger projects than what you thought maybe you could do. And uh, you might just surprise yourself. i got one more question for you yeah, from well, Thomas, Thomas Doubting Watchtower. Can you heat copper and forge it? Yes, you can. Uh, now, yes and no. So that's a blanket statement. There's certain coppers out there that they're a machine-grade copper. They're a machinable copper. So you have to be careful with some of them. Uh, some of the alloys, they're like red short, and they're only a machinable type thing. There's not too many of those. Most of the copper that you find out there is malleable copper, so you can forge it. Um, the stuff that's harder usually has a higher level of tin in it, uh, not enough to make it bronze, but just enough to make it a pain in the butt to work comparatively to other copper products. Uh, but you can heat it up. Don't get it over a red heat and temperature when you're forging on it, and use tongs. You cannot hold a bar of copper <laughs> and, and forge on the end of it. You're going to burn yourself. Don't do it. I've done it. It it's was very stupid. Good. It is a great conductor of not only <laughs> electricity but heat. Very fast to your palm and your hand. So um, you have to use tongs when you're working with it hot. So if you're at a point where you got to take and you know you've got to work with it, but maybe you don't have tongs or something like that, it's okay to work it cold, and that would be the suggestion. Good. Yes. Hopefully that answers. That How did everybody beautiful. enjoy the stream? Let Jessica know. Yeah. Hopefully you all did. Hopefully I answered enough questions. Again, thank you all for the super chatters. Thank you to everyone who's decided to collaborate with me in doing this little wrought iron project. The door's open, wide open, do what you want, have a lot of fun with it. Um, I am excited to see what uh, Tim at Big Dog Forge, John Switzer at Black Bear Forge, and David comes up with, David at Working With Nature. I think their channels will be linked up in the description. I do have the playlist, on. yes. I okay. have the playlist down in the description. Yeah, for so the, the playlist for the collaborative is going to be in the description down below. And it's a community, it's a community playlist where they'll be able to add their videos to that playlist as they get them made. And, uh, you know, I think this is going to really kind of get people to start thinking outside the box. Because John, and I know I'm talking, I'm going on here, but John Switzer, he comes from a totally different background than I do. Tim, a big dog forge, he comes from a completely different black background than 
either John or me do. Um, and then again, and then the real wild card is David at work with nature. He comes from a, a completely different background. I mean, he's in India, right? He's in India, and he's made himself like a sweet little uh, bicycle-powered power hammer, basically, that he's finally motorized and other stuff. And, uh, you know, again, he's doing neat stuff over there, but it's kind of interesting It'll be interesting to see what everybody comes up with. Yeah, everybody so. has a different, uh, coming from a different background. Yep, it? yep, everybody's coming from a different background. Um, I, one thing I will say about John Switzer, I'm really proud of him for stepping out of his comfort zone. Uh, he was going to make rather an axe or an adze out of wrought iron, something he's more comfortable with because that's what he does for his day-to-day -day business. But he's decided that he's going to do a dragon um, door knocker. He released the video of that today. He's going to do a dragon head door knocker. And it's going to be like a traditional. It's going to be all made out of the wrought iron. From what he said, everything to the rivets, to the nails, to you name it, right? He thought he was going to do that all out of wrought iron. Uh, so go check out his video. I did a community post about it. He just released that today. That's John Switzer at Black Bear Forge. It's also in the playlist. I'm okay. I added it. It's before. already in the playlist, so make sure you go check that out. And then, uh, and then I'm just waiting on Tim. Waiting on you, Tim. And yeah. David, we'll see I, what you guys do. His is being mailed. His, <laughs> so his is being it'll mailed. Be a little bit longer, but. Oh, have we not shipped it yet? We, we did, yeah. Yeah, we shipped it on Monday, but okay. it's about three. Oh, he got it already, I think. Oh, did he? Yeah, he okay. mentioned it in his last stream. Wow. Waiting on you, Tim. <laughs> <laughs> no rush. No rush, brother. Have, have fun with it. So that's it. I'm going to shut up. I'm going inside. I'm done working for the evening. Sounds How's that good. sound? Sounds good. Sounds mm -hmm. fun. So thank you all so much for joining us in this stream. Thank you for watching. Uh, again, let us know what you thought of the stream. Maybe jump back in the comment section after the stream is published, you know, and uh, just let us know what you thought of the stream, things like that. And uh, we greatly appreciate each and every last one of you. Yep. And that's going to be it till Monday, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah. Make sure to join us Monday evening at 7 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. We'll do our business live stream, and you can come check us out there. If you got any business questions around the subject of blacksmithing, um, that's where we'll answer all those in full detail, and it ought to be a good time. It's usually a more casual thing because I get to sit in a chair and just run my mouth. So it's a good <laughs> thing. So, thank you all once again. We're going to sign off now. Mm -hmm. You good, honey? Yep, we're good. I'm good. All right. All right. So, thanks for joining all us. All right. Thanks for joining us. Goodbye, all. Bye. God bless you all this week. <laughs>